is be very, very careful when you answer the phone in the summer. Uh, when the minister rings you, pretend you're on holiday and aren't coming back for a while because you end up writing reviews <coughs> about fundraising. And be particularly careful if Buckingham Palace ring you because you end up organising street parties. Uh, but uh, uh, this summer nobody's run, so that's all right. Um, but I just wanted to reflect a little bit uh, over the last uh, uh, the last year really, that's been operating. Uh, why uh, the, the group that I chaired and uh, Jill is here, very good to see uh, Baroness Bekeithley and two other peers who were engaged in this process. And uh, we reflected on statutory or self-regulation. That's I think was the key uh, uh, thing that we were being asked uh, to uh, reflect on. Two, two of the reasons <coughs> for self-regulation, which I think has been a phenomenal success, and I'll talk just briefly about how, how successful it's been. Uh, two reasons were pretty much in the public domain about why self-regulation. The, the first, of course, was the high costs engaged in statutory regulation compared to self-regulation, which I think is clearly true. Um, and secondly, the lack of flexibility that you can find in, in statutory regulation. This uh, group, uh, the fundraising regulator, has demonstrated, I think, that it's been extraordinarily flexible in adapting to charities and to uh, the area that they're involved in. But there was a third reason that I don't think we really articulated in the report, but it was important on my mind that I knew it was important in my colleagues' minds, the, uh, the three uh, peers that uh, worked uh, with me on this which is that a significant amount of money to the charitable sector comes from statutory sources and is pretty much controlled by the state, increasingly contractual. But we, uh, we believed in a free and independent civil society uh, and therefore it's quite important that we didn't allow the state to put its rather large size 12s all over the other remaining money that flowed into the voluntary sector. Uh, which, of course, is a relationship between citizens and civil society. You choose uh, as to whether or not you wish to support a particular cause in a particular way. So I think the other, for the philosophical reason, I think, uh, uh, that we uh, rounded on uh, self-regulation was to protect the independence of the sector and to cherish the relationship between individual donors and civil society, their choice to support causes with their money and indeed, although not relevant to this case, with their time. So that was the key reason why we argued for self-regulation. Uh, but of course, what we saw when we did the review was that self-regulation as it was constructed then uh, was not working that effectively in terms of the donor interest in particular. Um, it's an interesting dilemma, I think, because on the one hand, uh, you have uh, uh, the protection of individuals in relation to the ask, and on the other hand, of course, you have charities basically saying, we need to make the ask because we need to raise money because we need to do the good stuff that we do, and we can't do that. So there's a dilemma there. Uh, between the ask, uh, the way that the ask is made, and indeed the way uh, in which uh, organisations do good stuff uh, with the money. So that was really the backdrop to this. So <clears throat> I think there's an enormous amount to be positive about what has happened in the last 12 months. Positive in terms of <clears throat> the regulatory environment, and the fantastic work that Michael uh, and his board and his staff have done in elevating uh, this area of work. Fantastic. I mean, you just listen to this. And this has all happened really within 12 months. And this is an astonishing achievement, Michael, to you and your colleagues. Setting it up, not easy to set up an organisation from scratch. I pay tribute to my colleagues in the Chapter Aid Foundation who were. Uh, extraordinarily helpful in the very early days. Taking ownership of the code of practice, this was a, uh, an interesting debate about ownership of, by the professional, ownership by the regulator. 
Uh, this was quite key, actually, in, in the work that we did, uh, Jill and I, Howard and William did, uh, was that there were no real regulatory structures now where the profession completely controlled the modus operandi of doctors. That's good enough for solicitors. That seems to me that's good enough for fundraising. So that was an important uh, uh, issue. They've established a relationship with other regulatory bodies, with our colleagues in the Chinese Commission, and I'm very pleased to see with you. Uh, and also with the Information Commission. We tried to avoid uh, engaging in discussions about data protection because that would have taken slightly longer than we had available. But nevertheless, it continued to intrude. Uh, and it had to be dealt with, and it has been dealt with, uh, and that is great uh, to see. And then the fundraising preference service, probably the most controversial recommendation that we made, and we made it, nobody else made it, and nobody else told us to make it, David. Uh, so uh, we made it, uh, and we made it uh, because we wanted to look at the balance between um, individuals uh, and the charity and, and put some power in uh, the hands of the donor. My own view, I think I think I was wrong by the media, probably by you though, and uh, asked whether or not I was disappointed that the fundraising regulator had come up with a slightly more subtle uh, suggestion than, than the one that we made. And I said, no, I'm delighted because it achieves the objective I want, and somebody could spend a little more time thinking about it than, I, than we could at the back end of August. Uh, and actually, I think what has been designed is outstanding, excellent, gives the donor control and able to make choices, as opposed, I uh, understand the minister was mildly disappointed. Well, mildly disappointed is all right by me. Uh, but. Uh, um, but it is, I think, a, a much more, uh, a better system, actually. Uh, and I'm always pleased when somebody does something better than I suggested. Um, finally, what needs to be done now? Where are we now? The, one other point, sorry, before I get to the final, is that the sector itself has also responded to this. It's not just the regulator. It's also the fact that the sector's got the message. It's as revising its approach to some fundraising, look at what Cancer Research UK is doing, look at what the RNLI is doing, they are beginning to respond to this changing environment. So there are many charities that get it and are beginning to change. There's been a focus on the donor experience and I'm particularly pleased that my former chairman, Sir Martin Lewis, is here because he chaired that group, looking at the cultural change that's necessary in relation uh, to charities' behaviour. We did, as been mentioned, uh, work on the whole issue of consent, engaging Oxfam, engaging uh, Battersea Cats and Dogs, and also chaired by the Chief Executive of the British Red Cross, who gets it. So that's important, that the charities themselves are beginning to respond, more than beginning, they are, <coughs> fundraisers are responding to the environment that's been created. And it's important that we pay uh, appropriate acknowledgement to what charities are doing as well as the regulator. But what next? Well, <coughs> I think the crucial issue in order to <coughs> sustain the view about self-regulation, if we believe in self-regulation, is to ensure that the fundraising regulator is properly resourced. And this comes back to the levy. Now, I know that the board have determined that uh, uh, they will publish those who have paid the levy. And that's a very honourable way of approaching this. But my advice is to publish the names of those who have not paid the levy to name and shame, to put it out there, and let them explain why they do not support the notion of self-regulation. I leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you very much.